Hello, welcome to part 11 of Catholic Charismatic Attack on God's SDA Church. Keep in mind that this program is solely for Seventh-day Adventists for the purpose of education and not to be sold to the public. And keep in mind that as an ordained SDA minister, I'm standing in loyal defense of God's Seventh-day Adventist Church against the terrible attack that's going on against it. In this program, you're going to see things leading people to the second death just as surely as this dear man was led to the first. This little boy wanted to become famous, and he did. The whole world learned of him and his offshoot. In this program, we're going to look at this very offshoot and other offshoots. In this program, we're going to expose strange and unsuspected offshoots. Offshoots that are, believe it or not, a tricky part of the Catholic charismatic attack on God's Seventh-day Adventist Church. But we're also going to uplift the lovely Jesus and His power and His love for you, friend, and for the people of this world we're going to see his love and his power to save. We're not going to look at David Koresh first. We're going to look at him second. Oh, yes. Because what we're going to look at first has some strange similarities to David Koresh and happens to be a daughter of the Roman Catholic institution in this attack. Watch closely. The biggest danger was that they took me in and I was thinking it was a Christian church. And it wasn't a Christian church. It was a cult. Are you saying that the Mormon church pressures individuals into divorcing their spouses when they're not measuring up to the church's standards? And here's a church that teaches family unity and they destroyed my marriage. Today, the Mormon Church claims a membership of over 8 million people. 300,000 people convert to Mormonism every year. The Mormon Church has become one of the world's most powerful financial institutions, and it has 4.2 million members in the United States. Joseph Smith taught the taking of many wives. In addition to his first wife, Emma, Smith appears to have enjoyed many other wives. Polygamy became a standard requirement necessary for entrance into the highest level of heaven, which is referred to as the celestial kingdom. Brigham Young, the second prophet of Mormonism, said, quote, The only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy, unquote. Mormon scripture says, quote, If ye abide not in that covenant, referring to polygamy, then are ye damned, unquote. That's in Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, verse 4. In the past 160 years, the Mormons have been fragmented into over 100 groups who still claim Joseph Smith as a prophet of God and that the Book of Mormon is divine scripture. Well, I was born and raised in the Mormon Church, and I can remember, uh, because of my heritage, going to my cousin's family reunion, and we had to wear name tags with um, the wife's name so we, could, so we knew which family we were descended from. We were raised with the basic tenets of Mormonism, including polygamy. That is what was openly and freely practiced uh, in our community. My great-grandfather, John D. Lee, was a polygamist. He served under Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He had 19 wives and 64 children so that he could become a god as God is now. He really believed that God and Jesus are polygamists and that every Mormon man would have to have a lot of wives. My father had a total of 11 wives. We were very sincere about all the aspects of Mormonism. Uh, we used the Book of Mormon as one of our main sources of uh, knowledge. 
section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the Mormon scriptures, say that you must have plurality of wives. It is a requirement in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It is clearly stated that uh, if we are to attain the highest degree of glory, that we uh, must do the works of Abraham. Therefore, we were taught that in order to attain the celestial glory, uh, a man must take more than one wife. There's also the warning that any person who will not believe this and enter into polygamous temple marriages, they shall be destroyed. So the pressure was on always for men to uh, marry several women. It's been estimated there, there's between 25 and 30,000 polygamists in the state of Utah. I was in the Mormon church for 11 years, never missed my tithing once. I had a temple recommend. And then the Lord showed me how that they had departed from the original track that Joseph and Brigham had set it out on. They passed a law that a man could only have one wife. And actually, uh, it's, the, it's the order of heaven for a man to have more than one wife. Those who take their religion most seriously uh, return to polygamy because it has not uh, been uh, expunged from Mormon scripture. In fact, if a Mormon is very honest, he uh, probably needs to be polygamous. Are you involved in fertile marriage now? Yeah. There were problems. <laughs> Jealousy being the primary problem. Uh, the man reigns supreme in polygamy. We're trying to educate uh, people on how to get the father back in his place in the home. And when that happens, then the, the woman will follow and uh, more wives can be added. My father constantly claimed revelation for every last thing that we did and controlled everything that we did as much as he could. And um, I came to find out what, what a perverted thing he was really involved in. He would actually take uh, several of his wives to bed at once. And he was very involved in uh, marrying other men's wives. Polygamy is a horror. The history of polygamy is a history of women who shared their men. And uh, it's a history of power and manipulation. The youngest girls uh, were reserved exclusively for the older men that would have a harder time securing more wives. So that's how they worked it. And my father, um, he, he got most of his wives by bribing other men with his daughters. I was one of the ones that refused to fall into that, and I chose my own husband and uh, married and had a very loving relationship for 15 years and uh, until I lost them through this blood atonement process. Just like her mother, the Roman Catholic Church, the Mormon Daughter Church teaches that there are sins that a person must do more than trust in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of. They believe that the sinner must have his own blood spilled, just like the Roman Catholic nuns have done in the convents. The Mormon leaders are walking a tightrope in the public eye and that of their members to both confirm and deny the blood atonement. And what is this blood atonement? Watch closely. On the 27th of June, we were carrying on our life as usual, and um, happened to be the 144th anniversary of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. My half-brothers came into our office and murdered my husband. At the same time, there were three other consecutive deaths uh, going on. My brother-in-law, Duane, and his eight-year-old daughter, Jenny, was with him, and they also killed her. Our names were on the list of uh, to be atoned for. Uh, my father uh, believed that we were traitors to God's cause and that our blood must be shed to atone for the sin of uh, turning against light and knowledge, as he supposed. Blood atonement is if you have charity enough uh, for uh, someone to save them, uh, the shedding of their blood is the only way that they can atone for certain sins. People really thought they were doing a favor in my great-grandfather's day to shed the blood, save their soul. 
and is still taking place today. My great-grandfather John D. Lee was one of the Mormon men who were called avenging angels or destroying angels. It was their duty, their obligation to cut the throats, shed the blood of people who were apostate Mormons, who were, who were guilty of speaking against uh, the authorities. Jesus shed his blood that, uh, as an infinite sacrifice, but there are some sins that the blood of Jesus cannot atone for, and there it therefore it requires the shedding of uh, that man's blood to atone. For adultery, for apostasy, for marriage to a Negro, for not receiving the gospel, for lying, or any of the other offenses, they'd have to have their own bloodshed to have forgiveness of sin. To put it simply, my father's beliefs stem directly from Mormonism. Not one, not one thing is different than what the Mormon, early Mormon doctrine is. The original doctrine that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught is exactly what I believe. I'm now at present baptizing people, and I have five apostles now, and we're out to teaching and, and preaching the gospel, trying to get the Mormons into the original uh, doctrine that Brigham and Joseph had it set on. And I refuse to give it up. People are still killing each other, shedding the blood so they can have forgiveness of sin. And it comes directly from Joseph Smith and from Brigham Young. There's been 27 murders since uh, 1972. My uncle, my sister, my brother Arthur, my brother committed suicide, which I, is a direct consequence of all of this. I would just like uh, you to know that uh, if anything happens to me ever or to my children, I will uh, personally, uh, I believe the Mormon Church in general will be responsible because the very doctrine of blood atonement stems from Mormonism. Oh, friend, avenging angels, destroying angels, blood atonement list, slaughter weapons, the Mormon Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Branch Davidians, the Jesuits of Rome. Oh, friend, what do the actions of these have anything in common? And what does it all have to do with the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church? Watch closely. Well, Dick was killed in 1972. Uh -huh. He was flying his airplane and he'd been after a week of prayer up at Auburn Academy. Uh -huh. And uh, two students were with him. And. Um, uh, we got the word the next morning that he had been killed, yeah. and of course we went through, I mean, he came back and we buried him in, in La Sierra. Uh -huh. But I didn't know this other until about six years ago. What other? About Jim Arabito? No, no, about the possibility that Dick was on the Jesuit hit list. Oh, I see. Now, uh, so go ahead, tell us about what happened and what you learned about that. Okay, this um, fellow worker came to me and he said, well, we, coming back from lunch, we got to talking about different things that the papacy had done. Uh -huh. And so he says, well, you know about that experience with Dick, don't you? I says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Talk real loud. Okay. So when we got back to the hotel, we stood in the hallway and he further explained to me that, uh, yes, Elder Miller, when he was... Um, the Religious Liberty Director. You mean Cyril Miller? Yes, Cyril hey. Miller, when uh -huh. he was the Religious Liberty Director for the Southwest. Uh -huh. And you know, years ago, they used to come to a different areas and have a religious meeting update. Religious case. Liberty Meeting, yes. Yes, they would yes. have an update for us. Uh -huh. So at this time... Um, the papacy were, didn't like that. Well, I'm sure <laughs> that might have been all right. But anyway, at this time, they were in the Oklahoma area. Uh -huh. And in the Oklahoma area, a young lady came to them at this church, and they said, I need to talk to you. Uh -huh. And so they found a room where they could talk, and she said, um, I have just finished a business course, and I find myself now working in the Jesuit headquarters in this area. Oh, really? She said, Elder Miller, your name is on their list. Hit Stanley list. Stanley Harris's name is on their list. Huh. 
Dick Barron's name is on their list. Yes. Besides that, one of their men is pastor of one of the largest churches in, in Florida. He, I mean, he was person was in San Antonio. Uh-huh. Which was in our union, in our conference. Uh, wait a minute now. What you said was so amazing, I need to absorb it. She said that she's work. This is an Adventist lady. Mm-hmm. And she's working in Oklahoma at a Jesuit headquarters. headquarters. And she said that Cyril Miller, Dick Barron, and uh, Stanley Harris is on the hit list of the Jesuits to die. Mm -hmm. There is also one of the Jesuit men is pastor of one of the churches in San Antonio. A Presbyterian church? No, it was an Adventist church. Huh. He was pastor of one of our Adventist churches. From there, that man went to be also on the General Conference Committee, but he was pastor of one of the largest Spanish churches in Florida. Huh. Well, then she says, and I can get you more information. They cautioned her to be very careful uh -huh. not to take anything out of that office, because even her own life would be in jeopardy. Yeah, out of what office? Out of the Jesuit office where she was working. Oh, I see. Hmm. And this was an Adventist lady? Adventist lady. Huh. So then a number of, oh, maybe a couple of years ago, I saw Elder Miller at a departmental meeting, and I reminded him of this incident that he had had and check, just checking it out he says yes he says Span stanley harris was supposed to have been killed in an airplane accident hmm. and i said to him my husband was huh. and he said yes i know well yes. i am concerned because when i heard this later on about jim arabito yes uh, i put together again with what elder richards had told us that he was convinced that we were infiltrated. My husband... Elder Richard said that. Yes, he had told us this uh -huh. early in our ministry. Yes. And this is my concern. Um, this is happening, and I believe it happened to Dick. He spoke very clearly on the Mark of the Beast. Uh, the Adventist message. Yes, the Adventist message. But you see, Dick was very um, considerate and pointed out why Protestantism is failing. Yes. Uh, he pointed, he wasn't harsh against the Catholic people, of course, but it was the system. Yes. That was... Um, we love the Catholic not, people. That's right. They're wonderful people. I'm so, I feel like it's a privilege to meet you. I <laughs> met your husband in the meetings, and it was such a blessing to me in 1970 when I was in the Army in San Antonio to go to those meetings of him and Ray Turner. It was like uh, just going to heaven, getting out of those barracks, you know. But uh, so now I'm so happy to meet you, his wife. And, and uh, to hear you say these things substantiates what I've been learning all over this country from many people. And uh, to hear you say about L a Elder H.M.S. Richards Sr., what he said about it, he knew what was happening. And plus, many other people know what's happening. That these uh, exposing it are true Seventh-day Adventists, standing up for the truth. Praise God. Before we look at the second offshoot, it's appropriate now to look at this matter of faithful Seventh-day Adventists being murdered, being illegally disfellowshipped, fired, churches, and even a whole conference being illegally disbanded. Oh, friend, if after watching all 11 of these programs in this series, you don't yet believe that the Roman Catholic institution is attacking God's SDA church according to Revelation 12:17. You may believe it one day soon, only when it's too late for the foolish virgins to escape the snare. May God help us as our prayer to press together as faithful Seventh-day Adventists with our eyes open towards the lovely Jesus is my prayer. Watch closely. Uh, the shedding of their blood is the only way that they can atone for certain sins. People really thought they were doing a favor in my great grand. That cache of weapons out there uh -huh. was not for defensive purposes. Huh. That was for an offensive purpose to carry out and fulfill Ezekiel Man. Oh, really? Against and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I feel like, and I'll go on record, those weapons were going to be used against our, our people. In the churches yes. to kill them. Yes. Now, and I just interviewed a, a dear Branch Davidian. What happened in that? Were you, you were in there with them? Yes. 
with David Koresh, right? That's right. Um, February 28th, things started. Uh, I thought it was going to be a morning like any other morning. And the situation came up, and we decided that at some point we knew that we could not be fearful. We had to trust God through it all. Uh -huh. And that no matter what they were doing outside, we had to put our faith and trust in God. Yes. And this is what we had all through the time. I was there for three weeks, and uh -huh. then on the 21st of March, I left. And um, after that, we waited for everyone to come. Uh -huh. And that morning, the 19th of April, when they started doing the things to the building, they, they had said, the government had said they were going to preserve everything. Uh -huh. And we wondered, well, what was going on? Why why aren't they waiting? Uh -huh. They told us when we came out, we had faith in the government that they were going to uh -huh. help us and do all the things they told us on the on yeah. loudspeakers. And we had that faith, but we now can see that the government does what they need to do for themselves. Yeah. And what date was the fire? The, 18th, uh, the 19th of April. April. Yes. And uh, what date was it that they at first attacked the compound? Uh, February 28th. Okay. And how long had you, been, had you been in there before they attacked it? Um, oh, I had lived there five years. Oh, in the compound? And, well, we had the other homes there, and then eventually the homes were taken down to make the one big house. Oh, I see. Which made it convenient for everyone, because then we all were together. We had our studies together. We were able to not have to walk through the night. So what was it like living in there? They say that uh, David had beaten the babies and everything. Is he, that loved, he loved every child there. And he didn't beat the babies? No, he did not beat the babies. He wanted the mothers to train them up. Uh -huh. From the womb, he wanted them trained. Uh -huh. He wanted them to know that everything that they did helped bring their child to be more of a loving child. Uh -huh. His children, he had three children there, that they were very calm, very quiet. Uh -huh. And I saw it from the time his um, oldest boy was uh, a year old, he would sit there. Cyrus? Cyrus, that's right. Uh -huh. They said that David had many wives in there. Was that true? No, he had, I saw from 1984 when I first met David, actually. Um, I saw his wife, Rachel, uh -huh. and although they say she was 14, she was almost 15 the next month. She was a very tall, very mature young lady. Uh -huh. I did not find her as being very young in that respect. Uh -huh. and they try to make it seem as if he had a very young child. She oh. was a very capable, intelligent woman and very mature. Uh -huh. And as it turned out, um, I saw the next year they had their son, Cyrus, uh -huh. and I had the few years later, they had two more children. I see. And these are, this is the wife and the, the children I saw him with. These uh, are the ones I saw him yeah. loving and cherishing, and I never saw him with any other woman in that respect. I see. So he didn't have children by other women. I didn't see that. I see. And how many wives do you have? One. One wife. One, one wife. Have you I've committed? I've always had... Have I committed adultery? Is what you're fixing that have, have you committed adultery? <laughs> no, I don't commit adultery. You telling me the truth? I am telling you the truth. Have you beaten children? No, I do not beat children. I think the girl's name was Aisha. Yeah, was her parents there? Her parents were there. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. Did they keep the Sabbath and believe in Ellen White? Yes, very much. We used to read uh, early writings and a lot of her writings all the time. Uh -huh. We read about things of the great controversy, uh -huh. talking about the last days and how these different situations are going to come about. And uh, They said they had lots of guns in there. Did they have lots of guns? I saw no more than what they say people in Texas would have. They say that he oh, did have a situation where he was trying to build a business. Did you get to know lots of people in there? Oh, different people from Australia. Over England. 100? Oh, yes. There were children there uh -huh. also, many, many children. Uh -huh. And uh, many of the children were my own. But, oh. Uh, Yes. I lived there, and I still have three little ones that I praise God for that. I'm um, praying that I will continue to be able to show them that God is first in their life. Yes. And uh, yeah. the things of the world are going to pass away. You know, if many of the people in there were members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Most of the people, many. Were people, Adventists. They had been Adventists from the different churches. And, and were still members. And they were still members in the sense that they still felt their allegiance to the church, uh -huh. but they believed that God had wanted us to take a step closer to what Sister White had said. Many of the things I would talk to people about in the special resurrection, uh -huh. vegetarianism, these things the people didn't read much about. The people that were in there, uh, did they uh, think of themselves as Seventh-day Adventists or did they think of themselves as Branch Davidians? Seventh-day Adventists first because that was the truth that we all came in to knowing I and see. believing. First the Seventh-day Adventists.
over and over again and we had our plan down we had a diversion down all was put into effect and they were waiting We're extremely proud of what happened out there, how our agents conducted themselves under some unbelievable circumstances. They did a fantastic job. David Koresh says... They fired on us first, but like I say, they were scared. On the day of the raid, 29-year-old Mike Schroeder, a Branch Davidian, had left the Mount Carmel Center that morning to go to work in town. He learned about the raid on the radio. His wife, Kathy Schroeder, and their four-year-old son were inside the Mount Carmel Center. Mike, along with Woody Kendricks and Norman Allison, attempted to go home. Mike was shot seven times, once through his eye, another through the heart, and five times in the back as he attempted to climb over the fence. Norman Allison was captured immediately. He told the ATF that Mike Schroeder had been killed. The official lie released to the news media claimed that the men started a shootout as they tried to leave Mount Carmel. The story appeared on March 1st in the Associated Press and in the Waco Herald Tribune on March 2nd. But even this March 1st story reported that one of the three men was killed. Documents filed in Norman Allison's indictment also plainly show that the government knew the men were trying to get into the Mount Carmel Center, not shooting their way out. These documents also prove that the government knew on February 28, 1993, that Mike Schroeder had been shot. Yet Mike's body was left hanging on a fence for days. His family wasn't notified of his death until five days later. On the fifth day, Mike Schroeder's body, chewed by wild dogs and birds, was picked up on a grappling hook from a helicopter and transported like a side of beef on a meat hook. His mother was in Waco, and she was finally notified of his death by telephone. His wife inside Mount Carmel was never notified of his death by the FBI. Peter Gent's body was left atop a water tower. It fell apart and dropped to the ground when the feds attempted to lift it with a grappling hook. The Branch Davidians buried what remained of his body. Two of the ATF's own agents sum up the ATF mentality pretty well. And the thing that I find totally abhorrent and disgusting is these higher level people took that same oath and they violate the basic principles and tenets of the Constitution and the laws and simple ethics and morality. Mm -hmm. That's what disgusts me. In my career with ATF, the people that I put in jail have more honor than the top administration in this organization. I know it's a sad commentary, but that's my experience with ATF. Friend, here's an honest ATF man who feels that the prisoners couldn't be as unrighteous or unjust as his leaders. Has that happened before? Will it happen again? Pilate was astonished at his bearing. Does this man regard the proceedings 
because he does not care to save his life, he asked himself. As he looked at Jesus, bearing insult and mockery, without retaliation, he felt that he could not be as unrighteous and unjust as were the clamoring priests. I find no fault in this man, he declared. Standing behind Pilate in view of all the court, Christ heard the abuse, but to all the false charges against him, he answered not a word. His whole bearing gave evidence of conscious innocence. He stood unmoved by the fury of the waves that beat about him. He stood silent, but his silence was eloquence. Oh, if Pilate had only stood firm, refusing to condemn a man whom he found guiltless, he would have broken the fatal chain that was to bind him in guilt as long as he lived. Many who heard his words remembered them ever after, and as they thought of the man, pronounced innocent by the judge, yet given up to the mob law, they were led to ask themselves what power they were under. Jesus stood silent, but his silence was eloquence. Oh, friend, this is the way God's true, faithful SDA people will be in the near future. And the attacks like you just saw will be repeated. May God help us to cling to the lovely Jesus and love not our lives unto the death. But you say... The Branch Davidians killed themselves. Oh, friend, get ready for a shock. From now on, the Branch Davidians will have no contact with the outside world. The FBI orders all the utilities, lights, phone, water, gas, and plumbing to the house to be disconnected. A telephone wired directly to the FBI is put in place. The FBI sets up a steady stream of torture directed at the Branch Davidians, which included many small children inside the house. Bright stadium lights keep the house lit up 24 hours a day as a loudspeaker blares sounds of rabbits being slaughtered, Tibetan monk chants, and Nancy Sinatra's song, These Boots Are Made For Walkin'. One refrain of that song says, I just found me a brand new box of matches, yeah, and if you play with fire, you know you're going to get burned. Whenever a Branch Davidian falls into disfavor with the FBI, the tanks are used to crush the person's car, or in the case of the children, their go-karts as punishment. On March 27th, the London Times runs an article describing the equipment used by the FBI. The British Strategic Air Services sends a specially equipped plane to take thermal images of the insides of the house, allowing the FBI to see everyone who is inside by the heat reflected from their bodies. The FBI inserts fiber optic cameras into the walls of the house and into air vents. The fiber optic cameras are attached to transmitters that then broadcast the signal to the FBI receiver. The FBI can now see and hear everyone inside the house at all times. On April 19, 1993, the entire country saw live coverage of the fire at Mount Carmel. We were told that the FBI had decided to punch holes to insert a non-flammable CS gas to urge the mothers and children to come out. We were told this was done out of concern for the children. Shown here are some training scenes of the impact of CS gas on grown men. To understand the full impact of the following scenes, it is important to understand the layout of the Mount Carmel Center. The underground bunkers were not under the house. There was a cement tunnel that ran from a trap door in the end of the house out to two main underground shelters out in the yard, one of which was in front of the water tower. 
Anyone who was inside either one of the underground bunkers should have been untouched by either fire or smoke. In this picture, this end of the house is where the trap door to the underground bunker was. This film was taken long before 6 a.m., the morning before the fire started. There is a large hole at the base of the building, and the building has already been knocked off its foundation. There is a round hole in the side of the building. What appears to be a large blood splatter is visible on a wall on the other side. Something, perhaps a curtain, flaps from inside the building. Remember, with the sophisticated bugging and surveillance equipment the FBI used, the FBI knew where all of these people were at all times. They could see them and hear them. The underground bunker is in front of the water tower shown here before 6 a.m. This tank was over the tunnel to the underground bunker. For more than two hours, a tank is over the underground bunker or at the hole in the corner of the house at the entrance to the tunnel. Each time the tank opens, agents can be seen getting in or out, and the camera filming it conveniently cuts away. At approximately 6.10 a.m., smoke begins pouring from the underground bunker. None of the media mentions the fire in the underground bunker, yet this is when and where the first fire began, and where many people lost their lives. The official version of when things began starts here around 6 that morning. There is a flag propped against the door. The flag is not black, and it is not wedged in the door as the media reported. It is a red and blue flag. Whatever it is, it appears to be a flag of a conqueror, not a flag set outside by the Branch Davidians. The first tank that is sent in is a tank retriever. It has no apparatus to insert any kind of gas. It appears at precisely the time the smoke you saw earlier was seen coming from the underground bunker. It is not making so-called small holes to insert gas. It is destroying the end of the house over the trap door that leads from the bunker, making sure that no one inside the now-burning bunker can escape. A second hole is made in the side of the building, and a third hole is made at the front door. What these tanks are doing in each picture is collapsing the inside stairwells. The following footage proves beyond any doubt that the tanks intentionally set the house on fire. It proves that the Branch Davidians were murdered. Watch carefully as the tank backs out of the house. You can see that this tank has a gas jet on the front that shoots fire. You can also see the fire quite plainly. The tank goes into the house twice, and each time as it backs out, the fire at the gas jet is plainly visible. In the scenes that were shown throughout the country as the location where the fire supposedly started, smoke comes out a second-story window. As flames erupt from the second-story window, watch as a tank appears around the corner. There is an agent on this tank as if he had just leapt down onto the top of the tank. It is difficult to see the details on a television because the quality is poor, but in the studio, he can be seen removing a fireproof-type hood. Another man is seen on the roof. The FBI claims that this man is a Branch Davidian. However, watch as he jumps from the roof and walks away. The tape quality, again, is poor when it broadcasts on a television set, but in the studio, while he is on the roof, he appears to take off a jacket. He jumps and lands on his feet. He very calmly walks away. As he walks, he can be seen removing a hood. He also appears to be carrying a rifle in his right hand. As the fire burns, helicopters circle over the center with men pointing guns out of the open doorways. Before, during, and after the fire, none of the agents involved are at all concerned that there could be explosions or bullets in the house. In these next scenes, you can plainly see agents walking in and out near the fire.
In any ordinary crime scene, great pains are taken to preserve evidence. Here, tanks methodically push what remains of the house and evidence into the fire. The fire takes less than an hour to burn down the entire center. The fire is still smoldering at five that evening as agents walk in and around the fire. It is obvious that there is no genuine concern over the supposed millions of rounds of ammunition. Even though the FBI and the media consistently referred to this cement building as the bunker, the real bunkers were underground, as you were shown earlier. Many of the bodies that were found were found in the underground bunkers, not in the well house. The Branch Davidians, a group of Sabbath keepers, died, standing for what they believed to be the truth. Soon, many true and faithful Seventh-day Adventists will also die for standing for what they know to be the truth. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Remember that the lovely Jesus, innocent and holy, died for us. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes, those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars, those feet so tireless on ministries of love, spiked to the tree. That royal head, pierced by the crown of thorns, those quivering lips, shaped to the cry of woe, and all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to each child of humanity, declaring, It is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked on foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice. And this from love to thee. He, the sin-bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice and for thy sake becomes sin itself. Desire of Ages, page 754 and 755. Oh, friend, how short is time now. Our kind Heavenly Father, through His prophet, tells us that there will be many martyrs. I'm quoting now from Maranatha, page 199, quote, The two armies will stand distinct and separate, and this distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convinced of truth will come on the side of God's commandment-keeping people. When this grand work is to take place in the battle prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned. Many will flee for their lives from cities and towns. And many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth." Unquote. Oh, friend, do you think that we have to wait for the distant future before Sabbath keepers will be murdered in the United States? It happened April 19 of 1993. The Wall Street Journal, March 15, 1993, states, quote, On February 28, black uniformed men of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms wearing coal scuttle helmets 
and carrying German-made machine pistols, attacked the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. Fifty years earlier, in January 1943, black uniformed SS men wearing cold scuttle helmets and carrying German-made machine pistols attacked the Jewish compound in Warsaw, Poland. Point number two. The ATF men were searching for illegal weapons reported by a paid informant to be in the Branch Davidian compound. The SS men were searching for illegal weapons reported by a paid informant to be in the Warsaw ghetto. Point number three. Reports from Texas indicated that the Branch Davidians kept to themselves and harmed no one outside their compound prior to the ATF assault. Also, history tells us that the Jews kept to themselves and harmed no one outside their compound prior to the SS assault. Point number four. The U.S. broadcast news media tells us that the Branch Davidians practiced contemptible sexual rituals involving young children so that they are an evil religious cult. Nazi news media told the German population that the Jews practiced contemptible sexual rituals involving young children so that they were an evil religious cult. Point number five. The ATF invited the U.S. news media to document the ATF assault to show the American public how dangerous the Branch Davidians are. The SS also had propagandists document its assault to show the German public how dangerous the Jews were. Point number six. Four ATF men were killed and 16 were wounded in the initial assault on the Branch Davidian compound. 11 SS men were killed and an unrecorded number wounded in the initial assault on the Warsaw Ghetto. Point seven. After the initial assault, the ATF men arranged a truce so children could be evacuated from the compound and they could tend to their casualties. After the initial assault, the SS men also arranged a truce so children could be evacuated from the compound and they could tend to their casualties. Point eight. The ATF men called up military units with armored vehicles to the Branch Davidian compound after encountering fierce resistance against the initial assault. The SS also called up military units with armored vehicles to the Warsaw Ghetto after encountering fierce resistance against the initial assault. Fifty years have passed, but little has changed." Unquote. The above is found in the police magazine called Aid and Abet, Volume 2, Number 4. Oh, friend, this that I've just read to you shows two groups of Sabbath keepers. One group murdered in 1943, one group murdered in 1993. Oh, friend, do you think that we must wait into the far distant future until Sabbath keepers will be murdered again? Friend, it happened April 19. Friend, we must not be stopped from getting God's three angels' messages out to the people of this world. Friend, soon th people by the millions are going to be dead on the ground. May God give us His tender love, tender love for souls in our hearts, friend, before they're dead. Friend, in view of the horrors just ahead of us, in view of the fact there will be many martyrs, in view of the fact many of God's true Seventh-day Adventist church are going to again be murdered, in view of the fact the devil is trying to stop you and I from getting God's last three angels' messages out to the people, in view of the fact of the mighty promises of our God, I am going to say that anybody that gets 1,000 of the National Sunday Law books for a donation of 39 cents each to reach 1,000 precious souls, I'm going to say that you will receive 100 extra books free, free 
is to encourage you to help you reach these dear people, these dear souls, before they're dead. Oh, that's my prayer, that God will give us his tender love in our hearts. Now, my wife, sweet Vanita, and myself took a trip to Waco, Texas. We sure did. We went there to see what we could learn that would be helpful to God's Seventh-day Adventist people all over this world. Sweet Vanita and I walked up and down the streets. We stayed in the very motel that the ATF agents stayed in. We uh, videotaped and we looked around the ruins of the Branch Davidian compound. And I'm going to show you now a little of what we found. Sweet Vanita walked with me many places. We interviewed a number of people to see if they, these non-Adventists, connected the Branch Davidians with Seventh-day Adventists. Everyone we interviewed did not connect the two groups. They did not associate the two groups. We found that it was mainly the media. We stayed in the same hotel where the ATF men stayed, and we interviewed the business manager of that motel. So they rented the whole motel? Just, yeah, they had almost every hotel in town. Really? Yes. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Uh, for quite a while. For weeks. Um, for months. Months. We had David Crush's mother stay here, hmm. and we also had David Crush's brother stay here with us when he was coming through with Dateline. It was costing the taxpayers, I think it was $2 million a day. I think they have all the soldiers and everybody else down here. Really? Were they nice people? They were great. I couldn't say enough good things about them. We hadn't. We didn't have one problem with they were here. Oh. We were the best protected hotel in town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was nice having them here. It really was. They were very easy to get along with. Yeah. Very nice people. I bet they were friendly, too. Very. Uh-huh. They helped out as much as they could. As a matter of fact, the um, ATF sent us a plaque after they left in appreciation. Oh, really? That's hanging over our desk right now, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. That was interesting. We went to the newspaper office in town and we purchased a copy of every single newspaper that had ever been published by that newspaper company on the incident of the Branch Davidian compound and what happened in Waco. We found that it was not the people, but it was the papers, the media, the books, the media who have given the impression if the impression was given that the two groups were connected. The June 13, 1993 issue of the Roman Catholic paper, Our Sunday Visitor, tells about how not to become vulnerable to cults. And the SDA conference papers from England and the Mid-America Union helps you to identify people who may be cult leaders, who, number one, rebuke church leaders of sin. Number two, declare that the SDA church is in apostasy. Number three, influence SDA people to not give their tithe to the conference. Number four, people who do not obey the church manual. Number five, people who influence people to join a church within a church. Point number six, people who claim to be reformers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, among other things. These kinds of people are identified or warned against as possibly being cult leaders to trick and fool Seventh-day Adventists uh, and trick them into getting into a cult like the one at Waco. Referring to SDA layman, uh, or SDA ministers who are working for the Lord in what is called a ministry, but who are not on the conference payroll. It gives a caution that, quote, we disassociate ourselves from these fanatical fringe groups, infiltrators and offshoots peddling a different gospel before another Waco occurs, unquote. Oh, friend. Will another Waco occur, as he said? No wonder the prophet of God 
says, quote, the scenes of the betrayal, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ have been reenacted and will again be reenacted on an immense scale. People will be filled with the attributes of Satan. The delusions of the arch enemy of God and man will have great power. Those who have given their affections to any leader but Christ will find themselves under the control, body, soul, and spirit of an infatuation that is so entrancing that under its power, souls turn away from hearing the truth to believe a lie. Oh, friend, now do we need weak-kneed, wishy-washy cowards for preachers? Do we need men who will give in love the voice of stern rebuke? Listen to the prophet of God, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 140, quote, Today there is need of the voice of stern rebuke, for grievous sins have separated the people from God. The smooth sermons so often preached make no lasting impression. The trumpet does not give a certain sound. Many are not cut to the heart by the plain, sharp truths of God's word. The forerunner of Christ lost his life by his plain speaking. Why could he not have moved along without incurring the displeasure of those who were living in sin? O oh, friend, the prophet continues, quote, So men who should be standing as faithful guardians of God's law have argued till policy has taken the place of faithfulness and sin is allowed to go unreproved. When will the voice of faithful rebuke be heard once more in the church? They fired on us first, but like I say, they were scared. This is 
a display of our church literature. Uh-huh. Uh, which church is it? Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, I see. And that's what you are? And I am a Branch Davidian. Okay. Uh, the church was founded uh -huh. by uh, Ben Roden in 1955 uh -huh. as an upshoot from the Davidian Church, which was founded by Brother Hodden in, in the early 1930s. I see. Around. Do you think, according to... Uh, Ezekiel uh, 9, I believe it is, that the Branch Davidians have been given a mandate from the Lord to, at a certain time, to uh, actually kill the false Seventh-day Adventist leaders. No, no, I think that Ezekiel 9 was fulfilled right here with David Koresh. Oh, I see. And God did it, uh -huh. not us. It's not, it's not, it's the action of, uh, of angels with slaughter weapons. It is not uh, Branch Davidians to do this. It oh, never was. I see. You're saying that you think the angels slaughtered the Branch Davidians? Uh, I'm saying that God caused to happen what happened here. I That's see. a little bit different, actually. I see. Uh -huh. drove up with the uh, trailers and all this, uh, did an agent come up to the door and knock on the door? I can tell you that I saw the, the trailers come up and I thought it was wood. I thought we had bought wood from the lumber yard. Uh -huh. And I didn't see anybody outside. I saw, I saw nobody outside um, that even gave an impression that they were jumping out or anything uh -huh. until one man jumped out. Then uh -huh. I heard voices inside the building uh -huh. and then voices outside the building. And that was right in front of the front door. Uh -huh. So I knew somebody was talking. Uh -huh. And it was right after that I heard the shots, and then the shots started coming in the window. Hmm. And that's when I fell backwards and to save my children. You I fell down on the floor? To, yes, and pushed my children away from the window and to push them into a corner. Yeah. And then I looked back, and my little boy that's um, handicapped was still in front of the window, and the shots were coming in. Glass was falling all over him. Mm. The wood was being all broken up, and I could only think, was he going to die that way? Yeah. And my first thought was, if I can get a chance to him. And when they, they stopped, they stopped the, um, the gunfight for just one little bit, and I, I crawled on my hands and my knees to get to him, and I pulled him off. Yeah. By the time I got to him, the gunshots had started again. Uh -huh. So I kept my head down. Cause my first thought was, what if I get shot? Yeah. Then my children would be there left alone, and I didn't know what went. I figured that was the next step they would end up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, were many, when, the, when they drove up, did many of the people inside uh, have their guns ready? No, there was nobody ready for anything. Nobody was planned. No one knew that this uh, was ever going to happen. Well, I'm glad we have a wonderful Savior, Jesus, to look to, aren't you? If we did not have, we had no hope. Yeah. No hope whatsoever. There's no way. Yeah. They keep saying to me, how can you bear this? And I said, the only hope is in Christ. That's right. There's the only hope yeah. I have. There's no way that you can think of a husband who took care of you for t over 20 years and children that you go up and saw yeah. and love them. There's no way that you could have yeah. bear through this, except that you know God has a better way. And a better yeah. Plan. Now, uh, after that first attack on February 28th, uh, you stayed in there another, uh, what, three weeks? Three weeks, the 21st of March. And, what, what, and, of course, the agents were out there. What was it like living in there at that time? Oh, you kept hoping every morning. You're so thankful to see the sunlight. You kept hoping they won't come in the middle of the night. Uh. You kept hoping that they were going to be believe us, that we wanted to come out, and that David was going to come out. You kept praying that they would wait like they said they were going to wait. Uh -huh. You just had hope, and we just trust that God has allowed this to show the people that this is not... Yeah. The America that started. Hmm. This is not the place that God. We have no hatred against them. Yeah. We just think that God used them. Yes. Allowed them to bring this to the forefront to let people see what they should be thinking about. You know, yeah. We need to put our trust in God and not in man. That's no, for sure. Not at all. Not at all. 
wooden man at all. Uh, now, when you came out, uh, did they, uh, where did they take you? Uh, to the jail. They put handcuffs on me and took me over to the jail. And we got to speak to my two children. Uh, the other boy was over at another place. And he wasn't able to come. Uh -huh. And I spoke to my husband for the last time that day. Uh -huh. That was the last time. Uh -huh. and, uh, I told uh, him because he didn't come out, did he? No. Oh, friend, the lovely Jesus is so precious to us. May we work with him to reach the dear people before they're dead. Offshoots. We're talking about offshoots, leading people off the track of the truth of the Word of God. Here is the next one, right before our eyes. I was astonished when I uh, saw the latest junior guides that are coming out, yes. especially when I read the masthead. I couldn't believe that the stories I'm reading in this guide magazine huh. uh, were coming from uh, the Review and Herald Publishing Association in Hagerstown, Maryland, yes. and claimed to be a Christian story magazine for young people huh. provided by Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. In the heart of the magazine is their serial. Uh, it's run uh, 19 chapters already, and it's called The Quest of Eleanor Dagworth. Uh -huh. And what's happening is uh, it's just a story with no moral value whatsoever, uh -huh. set back in the Middle Ages. Uh -huh. The travelers arrive at the Bach farm in Windhamshire, and during supper, Mrs. Bach begins to tell him about her husband, who's been Prince Goffrey's scribe, told her about the tragic death of Prince Andrew, and so we go to the next guide for the next part of the serial. Yeah. What's happening? While the children were ordering supplies from the town grocer, Eleanor steps out the front door to look at the tower that the grocery says belongs to Dr. Scotia. As Eleanor turns to go back in, a crossbow arrow slams into the door, barely missing her. The shopkeeper panics and shoes everybody out the door. Here we go ahead with our, with our cereal. Go, run away. The shopkeeper slammed the door and a heavy lock bar clunked into place. Yeah. We flattened ourselves against the wall. That stupid coward, Max growled, shh, hissed Jane, and so on. Then we go to the next uh, part of it. This is chapter 18. Yes. The village fire bell rings, and Eleanor and Dennis and Max and Jane discover that Mrs. Bach's farmhouse is on fire. It's exciting. And Jane hurries to help Mrs. Bach, who's fainted, and Dr. Scotia arrives. And Dr. Scotia prescribes doses of a certain powder for the older woman. Mrs. Bach and the children take up residence in the barn. Later that day, Jane discovers that Eleanor is missing, and then we start the quest for Eleanor. This is yes. chapter 19. Uh -huh. uh, arriving back at the Bach farm, uh, <clears throat> Dennis is informed by Jane that a rat, that she had fed some of that powder, Dr. Scrocious prescribed for Mrs. Bach, yes. had died. Hmm. And so... Uh, Would you call that sensational? Sensational. Yeah. And, and uh, as we look at the... Uh, this is the last one that I have in my hand here. Yes. And the, the, the pictures uh, in and of themselves yes. are, are, are strange, and they get stranger. Yes, uh, they look actually Roman Catholic. They, they look Catholic. Yes, well, I think... And then uh, I will show you... And then here we have... It's part of the Catholic charismatic attack on it God's is, SDA it is church. It's a part of it, only yeah. they're getting down to our young children. It's very bold, too, isn't it? Very bold, right here. I had a strange dream that night, and of course, the. But look at uh, at their lesson, though there is a lesson in here. Yes. One small page, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and so on. Jesus taught that paying tithes were the way to go. You don't miss the real message. What? Laugh when you give. Our word hilarious comes from cheerful and so on and so on. Yes. This this is a sum total of the lessons that's taught in this junior guide. Yes. The, uh, now here's Jesus. Does that Jesus look like any Jesus that you've ever seen? Uh, no. Isn't uh, that strange? It's not the real Jesus. This this is is so uh, so Catholic oriented yes. with pictures and with words that are. Uh, Juniors don't yes. have a chance when well, they read this. You would probably warn 
the Adventist people and the Adventist children against it, wouldn't you? I would warn them if this was coming out of the world. I would say, don't touch that, but it's coming out of our printing presses in yeah. Hagerstown, Maryland, yeah. for our Seventh-day Adventist youth, and I certainly, look, look, at, look at the cover, see? Well, friend, we need to pray for these dear people, because that is not coming from true Seventh-day Adventists. No, it isn't. It is not coming from true Seventh-day Adventists. This is just a, a extended part of the Catholic attack That's right. on the Seventh-day Adventist Church and now on our youth. Yes. Oh, friend. The prophet of God cries out, What shall our children read? It is a serious question and demands a serious answer. I am troubled to see in Sabbath-keeping families, periodicals and newspapers containing continued stories that leave no impress of good upon the minds of the children and youth. I have watched those whose taste for fiction has been thus cultivated. The children should be educated to reject trashy, exciting tales and turn to the sensible reading that will train their minds to be interested in Bible story, history, and arguments. If their imagination becomes excited by feeding it upon highly wrought fictitious stories, they will have no desire to search the scripture or obtain a knowledge of truth to impart to others. Parents are asleep as to the importance of this subject. The Bible should be a book for study. Men who are under the power of the evil one are inspired by him to write overwrought fictitious stories with which our world is flooded. Unquote. Adventist Review, November 9, 1886. Friend, this is just what the Jesuits of Rome did in Oxford to corrupt the Church of England by getting the young men away from the Bible, away from the Bible, to other things, such as we've just seen. Quote, I call upon the children and youth to empty their minds of foolish vanities and make Jesus their everlasting friend. It is insanity to be quiet and at ease as so many are at the present time, having no assurance that they are indeed sons and daughters of God. Eternal interests are at stake. Put away that story. Fall upon your knees in prayer for strength to overcome temptations and devote your time to searching the Bible. And when Jesus reveals himself to you as a sin-pardoning Savior, reflect the heavenly radiance upon others. Now we come to the last offshoot. Uh, right now the church is doing its best to separate itself from this offshoot body who's mm. gone so deep in debt that it threatens the very structure of the uh, church uh, organizational structure with yes. the debt and they're trying to get legally separate uh, separated from the medical work today so that uh, mm. when it goes uh, obviously bankrupt already the the bonds uh, issued by Adventist Health Systems are junk bonds and their mm. credit rating is gone and mm. we are bankrupt. Mm. But uh, they're holding off the day of foreclosure in a hope that they can uh, develop a legal structure which keeps from taking all our church buildings and schools and colleges. Yes. I'm uh, sorry to predict they're not going to make it because we have taken federal funds mm. in our schools and in our hospitals and so on and therefore uh, we will be closed down by the federal government as every other uh, banking system, uh, savings and loan, and insurance companies are being closed now. Yes. Uh, they are already putting nonprofit corporations out. I checked here a couple years ago and 40 some nonprofit religious organizations had been shut down. What for? Uh, for uh, not running a program that was approved by the government. Mm. In other words, the government allows you to run a nonprofit corporation yes. uh, 
uh, and render some service which they consider a government service. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the, the basic philosophy of what's wrong here. When God started his church, he told us to uh, take care of the widow and the orphan and uh, uh, clothe the naked and feed the hungry and so on. This was the practical Christianity that we got up out from hearing a sermon and we went and served our fellow men. Yeah. Now all these church services have turned into government services and the socialist government uh, says we'll take you from the cradle to the grave. Right. We'll pay for your birth of your child and we'll pay for your funeral and we'll pay for all the Medicaid and Medicare in between and right. we'll give you social security and a check as you retire and so on. Mm -hmm. And as these church functions turned into government functions, the government has all of practical Christianity under their administration. Yes. And, and the government under the papacy. Right. And uh, this way, uh, this is how Israel was enslaved in Egypt. During a famine, Israel moved to Egypt, and they were, in order to buy corn for the famine, they gave all their property over to the government. Mm. And we've given all of our property over to the government today in the famine of God's word. Uh, we have ceased to follow God's instruction, and we are following government policy mm. and meeting government codes and ethics and uh, getting our subsidies from the government, and now they own us. Maybe that explains why... My wife, Sweet Benita, uh, was put in charge of ingathering for the church and uh, where she is as the uh, personal ministry leader and uh, received a <clears throat> document from the conference showing where the funds for ingathering go. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Of that, it says go to state uh, programs. Right. And so I wondered about how can the ingathering funds, hundreds of thousands of it, uh, around the country go uh, to uh, state uh, programs. So maybe this, what you just told us, would Well, that. you see, we have put our work under the American Red Cross. Oh, what, what was uniquely uh, service based on uh, Adventism and yeah. our, what we called the Dorcas Society in the yeah. early days, uh, following the example of Dorcas to help her neighbor, yeah. is now a branch of the Red Cross. And when we go out into the field, we don't go as Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, oh, yes, the Baptists have a group over here and the Adventists have a group, but they're all Red Cross workers. I see. And this way we have sold out our uniqueness, uh, even in Christian service, or we turn it over to the government. We find somebody in the gutter, we call the sheriff. We find a kid being molested, we call the welfare department. Yeah. And these areas of sin uh, and permeating society, we no longer handle. They are beneath us. And we go listen to platitudes in sermons and pretty churches, but we don't go out and do anything about any of it. Yes. And if you did anything, it would be called works. It's trying to save yourself by putting on a good front and mm -hmm. so on. And so in the ingathering folder, they have to give accounting of their funds to the government, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there has to be a percentage to back government-sponsored programs in order to be government accepted. And so uh, yes. very little of the money goes into Christian service yes. uh, in proportion. Most of it is administratively consumed. Yeah, I saw that a, a, a small part, portion did go to the van ministry in New York City, and I was very happy for that. That's uh, Every now and then you get a glimmer of light. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus would go along with any committee as long as it goes along with the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. In fact, the Council of Men brings wisdom. Now, we got to get back to this thing that happened at Loma Linda at the time that uh, we were on ministerial salary. Yeah. And they were wanting to go to intramural practice techniques, which were being used by other uh, university medical schools, where they could up the faculty pay mm -hmm. by having the faculty, quotes, become more productive in this uh, private patient practice. Well, we went into a council session, and each of the doctors was to bring uh, proof of uh, why we should go into this worldly system. And so reports were bought from the University of Miami or Chicago or, or uh, Berkeley or whatever. Mm. And uh, all these medical schools were going for intramural practice uh, kickback percentages. Yeah. And uh, these papers were read all around the table that night. To see what the Philistines were doing. To check on what the neighbors were doing to make more money yeah. within the law. 
And so uh, it came my turn to speak, and I had the book uh, Medical Ministry with me that has a chapter called The Percentage Plan of Snare. Mm. So instead of writing uh, a paper on, uh, on a worldly university's policy, yeah. I got out what I figured was principle, yes. spelled out in detail by uh, the prophet through the Spirit of God moving upon the heart of the prophet. And so I presented the different aspects from the writings of the prophet. Yes. And uh, uh, then it went to another doctor and another doctor, and they finally took the vote, and there were three of us out of the whole room full who said no to the new plan and the majority carried the day and they built the medical building and went into uh, mm. practice which finally split the whole medical work off from the ministry and mm. now we have the the whole Adventist health systems another corporation court means body so they're an entirely different body now within the church uh, separated from the Seventh day Adventist Church yes well then would you call that an offshoot uh, it's an offshoot that as you can shot get. Off. Offshoot as it can get. It's a it's a different corporation. Uh, right now, the church is doing its best to separate itself from this offshoot body, who's mm. gone so deep in debt that it threatens the very structure. It seems to me that if we were following God's plan, we would be emphasizing more of the eight natural remedies. Uh-huh. Uh, how to uh, teach people how to stay uh, stay healthy. Yes. Yeah. And uh, also take care of, of uh, simple illnesses. Uh, you know, the use of water is so important. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if people would drink more water, that there would be many diseases that would be prevented and, and, uh, and ameliorated <coughs> if they would just uh, be more knowledgeable about drinking fluids. That's correct. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the proper diet probably is one of the most important aspects of these natural remedies. And uh, if people would adhere to a proper diet, uh, we probably would find uh, that a very uh, much fewer patients would have to come to the surgery. Yeah. For probably the most of the patients wouldn't even be in the hospital now at all. Yeah. We do a lot of heart surgery down the hospital, and uh, I would say probably 90% of those people would not have had to go through that ordeal had they uh, paid uh, good attention to a, a good diet. Amen. Yeah, and that's what God told us in the little book called Ministry of Healing. Surely. Councils on Diet and Food. It's just it's so simple. But it's good to have a, a doctor like yourself say these things because when just anybody says it, it's one thing, but when a, a doctor in the medical profession, in surgeries like you are, and, 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 and in that system says these things, what God has said, it just somehow uh, emphasizes it, you know? <laughs> sure. Well, you know, there's much more interest in the population at large today for preventive medicine. Yes. People are interested in exercising. Uh, they're interested in a, in a uh, vegetarian diet. Yeah. This is really interesting. So we're living in a time now where our health message could go like wildfire if, yes. if we really pushed it. Yes. And, you know, God's prophet tells us that the time is coming when there'll be no work done in any line except medical missionary work. That's a very drastic statement, isn't it? That's so right. it tells us that drastic things are going to be happening That's right. very quickly. Yeah. And they are happening well, already. With medicine becoming so expensive, yes. nowadays, people are almost forced to adopt uh, more healthful practices if uh, they're to avoid landing in a very expensive environment. Much of the expense has to do with the increasing sophistication of medical science today with our uh, sophisticated diagnostic tools that we never had before. These are all expensive. Yes. And for a hospital to uh, survive nowadays, it mm. has to have a CAT scanner and other sophisticated uh, uh, medical diagnostic tools. Just to make enough just money. Just to make money. But in order to pay for it, they have to charge enough to, uh, to cover the cost. Yeah. Would you say medical, uh, the medical practice today is a big business? Oh, surely. Uh -huh. hmm. And probably we as a people have uh, fallen into that error. We, uh, the, uh, our hospitals today probably are largely there uh, as a result of the desire to make money. Hmm. Suppose the right arm got cut off from the body 
and was working independently, uh, became an independent ministry, uh, became an offshoot, so that they really didn't emphasize, they didn't preach the th uh, or even teach or even think about God's three angels' messages in the entire health system. Uh, what would God do or allow to be done with that right arm that had been cut off? You know, science will eventually catch up with what we've uh, believed all along, and uh, we, uh, I think that we should hang our, hang our heads in shame in many instances that we haven't been more uh, forceful in promoting some of these things, and uh, I can't help but believe that many people would be alive today yes. had uh, the Adventist Church been faithful to its uh, charter and uh, yes. and really promoted these things, there'd be more people alive today and in healthy condition. And have eternal life because That's they right. would have been taught how exactly. to have eternal life through Jesus. Uh, now, uh, the things that you were telling that we ought, that doctors ought to be teaching and doing, if they actually practice that, do you think any of them would get fired? Today? But I had medical ministry under my arm as the group broke up from making the vote to go to intramural practice at Loma Linda. Yes. And, uh, I was working very close with the dean at the time. Uh, we were close friends uh, because we were developing uh, new techniques in the school and uh, he was uh, quite complimentary to me about some of the things that I had brought into the school programming so that there was no strain between the dean and I. Uh, yes. we, were, we were close friends. But as we began to go out of this meeting, the dean motioned to me that he wanted to see me. And so I let everyone else leave, and just the dean and I were left in the room, and I had medical ministry under my arm mm -hmm. about to leave. And he tapped the book, and he said, don't bring that stuff in here anymore. Mm. And Was I he said, an Adventist? Yes. And I said, uh, well, uh, what do you mean, the, the uh, medical ministry? You, you don't want that? No, he says, that brings confusion. Hmm. And uh, I said, well, accept my resignation. Oh, he said, don't get excited. He said, uh, uh, I, just, I just don't want you confusing our meetings with that stuff. And I said, well, uh, I feel it's uh, direct instruction from God, and, and I'm sacrificing my professional life to be teaching here at Loma Linda. Yes. And uh, if, uh, if we're not basing our program on a thus saith the Lord, why then uh, accept my resignation? Most of, our, most of the personnel in our hospitals today uh, are non-Adventists. They of have them? no idea, they hmm. have no concept of what Ad Adventism is. When Jesus comes, his, his church, his remnant church, Seventh-day Adventist church, is going to be purified without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So what you've been telling me, uh, would you say that these things you've been describing will not exist in God's Seventh-day Adventist Church when Jesus comes? You mean the time of, his, of the second coming? Yes. Just before his second coming? Yes. And since the medical work will be the last to close up, <coughs> will it be existing in a different, uh, will it be uh, uh, engaged in, in a different fashion Way, than yes. it is today? Yes. Uh, I can't help but believe that must be true. Yeah. Well, you can see uh, some drastic things. Are hospitals uh, today be uh, treating people in the same way they are today, just before Jesus comes? Uh, this is a real good question, and uh, I have to believe that it's going to be vastly different. Yeah. It seems to me that um, perhaps we'll be go treating people with home therapy. Yes. Uh, you know, today with health care just going out of the ceiling, expense-wise. Yes. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be too expensive for anybody to have. Insurance costs are so high that uh, mm. the major, major portion of the population can afford it. Mm. And um, it would seem to me that if uh, our health work was to have an impact that we're going to have to get down the grass roots somehow. Yeah. So you can see some tremendous cataclysmic shocking things are going to be happening, God allowing them, so th that it'll be fulfilled where it says that soon no work will be done except medical missionary work. Mm -hmm. And uh, would that take some drastic thing?
to happen uh, for your doctor friends to be going door to door doing it like that? Well, that's pretty hard to conceive. All right, what we'd like to do here is bring a uh, few praises to God from a positive standpoint for gospel medical missionary evangelism Amen. and show how easily this can be done by anyone who uh, will take it up right where they are. We had the joy of taking a group of young people, approximately 30, and uh, bringing them into a conference structure at Chesapeake Conference. Uh -huh. And they're uh, renovating the Book and Bible House into a better living center and then having five city centers and three country centers. The young people went out with certificates, uh, community health programmer certificates from the School of Health at Loma Linda, uh -huh. and they put on programs based on ministry of healing and medical ministry. And without credentials and without a large budget, there were 55 baptisms uh, brought in uh, that first year as we worked together with the conference ministry. That was in Chesapeake group. Conference. Chesapeake Conference in Maryland, Delaware uh -huh. uh, area. And that was in uh, written up in the July 6, uh, 1972 Columbia Union Visitor. Uh -huh. And the article was without purse or script. It was uh, marvelous to see how quickly the work could go uh, in simplicity, as fire in the stubble. Young people were volunteers. They didn't get paid, right? That's correct. Uh, but the young people just witnessed that they were eating this simple uh, uh, diet. Yes. They were living the mm. uh, clean life and enjoying it, and month after month, and year after year, they were radiant and healthy. Beautiful. And uh, it was beautiful to be around them because their prayer life and their conversation, their dress was modest and yes. this type of thing. They were just lovely young people. Beautiful. Now, did they uh, conduct these public meetings in a city setting? Wherever they were asked. Some of it was uh, city center, some of it was school gymnasium, some oh. of it was... Uh, uh, church rostrum, just uh -huh. wherever they were asked to give a meeting. When we'd meet, we had uh, beautiful. A, a beautiful, this was in the same office where Elder Joe Cruz had his yes. uh, office in the basement and beautiful. did his beautiful program. We couldn't keep up with the invitations. Yeah. It was marvelous, the attitude of the people and the reception. And I just know that when the Holy Spirit's in a project, there's yes. no limit to what it says, an uh, army of youth rightly trained, how quickly the work could be finished. Amen. Well, it, it, it makes me feel like we ought to be doing something like that again. Well, it must be. This is how God's going to finish the work because no man can take the glory. At the, uh, the power that's in the program does not come from man. many initials after the name no. or big institutions. It comes from a, a, a tone of voice and from a look on the face yes. and the joy of yes. the testimony, that's where the power is, in yes. the presence of the Spirit of God. Amen. It was run off by people who were jealous of how much was being accomplished. Yes. As one dear elder said, uh, you're putting Andrews University out of business. I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got these young people out soul winning and they don't even haven't even gotten out of high school. He says, uh, you make it look like you don't even need to be educated. Oh, I said, well, you don't. Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's time to get the work done. Amen. Now, I'm not against education. I, I have a doctorate myself. But but uh, the university didn't teach me how to be a soul winner. No. It didn't teach me how to go to heaven. It no. taught me how to be a professional. Yeah. And professionalism has replaced much of our gospel medical missionary evangelism. Yes. I believe God wants us to start planning on advertising that these dear people watching right now will know that we're planning and I'll let them know when we're ready. Yes. We will have them come train medical missionary gospel what? Gospel medical missionary evangelist. Yeah. Never let these Van four names be separated. Let's say it again. Gospel, gospel medical, medical missionary, missionary evangelist. evangelist. Never let the four be separated. Let's do it. Let's, uh, uh, let's plan weekends where people can come from all over the country Yes, friend, praise God. Let's do it. Let's have a soul winning school to train gospel medical missionary evangelists for any age. 
I'll let you know in my monthly letter when we're ready. Now, I've put together this little book called Two Months to Live as a helpful tool in this work to be used in conjunction with the book National Sunday Law. Two Months to Live tells how to prevent cancer and how over 40 people were healed of it after being given up to die. Watch closely now as you see the SDA doctor mentioned in the book and one patient who was dying of cancer. I got a letter uh, from Elizabeth who lives in Texas. Uh, she got a uterine cancer. Uterine cancer? Uterine cancer. Uh -huh. And uh, she it was looking for me, Dr. Mitchell, uh -huh. but she couldn't touch with me. Now, uh, Dr. Mitchell is your name that I've given you in the book Two Months to Live. It's, uh, I've changed the name, so we, under we understand that. So go ahead. Yes, thank you. And so she uh, got the uh, Two Months to Live book from Jan Markison, and uh, so she started the program according to the Jan Markison's Two Months to Live book. Yes. About six months later, she went back to her doctor uh, to take uh, x-rays and they cannot find any more cancer cells. Oh, praise the Lord. That's Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful? You see, the doctors, they don't get any credit. God does, doesn't he? That's true. And uh, today the devil has counterfeits of healing, as we know the faith healers and all that, but God has a real true method of healing in his eight natural remedies. Isn't that right? That's correct. And so... Uh, when we obey his rule, the healing power is coming from him. Yes, that's not right. Not from the vegetables fruits. No. Coming from the God. That's right. Then she tried to call me, but she cannot uh, locate me. Yes. So she started the program, what the two months to leave says. Yes. So after she followed about six months. Yes. Is she dead now? No. She, Praise the Lord. <laughs> they cannot find any cancer. Wonderful. Through the x-rays. Isn't that wonderful? Well, God gets all the credit, doesn't he? Yes. Sir. Amen. And uh, you're the Dr. Mitchell of the book, but I know you've told me you do not take the credit. No. Now, um, I just interviewed you, and there is a, a man here in this area in Florida who was given two months to live by his doctor and I just interviewed you, what you did for him and what you gave him, and I put it in that little book, Two Months to Live, because the medical board forbid you to treat any more cancer patients, and I, uh, but when I wrote this book, God impressed me to write it so that people that uh, had cancer and were dying could do the same things that you gave to the man, and God could heal them, and they couldn't arrest me for treating patients, could they? That's right. Because I just wrote the book. Right. But here's this lady in Texas, who, uh, yes, you have her letter here uh, telling about, she's telling about her experience, yes. and she signed her name on there, uh, but uh, she's still alive, and is she doing okay now? Wonderful. I got a phone call from uh, North Dakota, some retired Seventh-day Adventist uh, minister. Yes. She got uh, acute cancer, melanoma. That's very severe, isn't it? Right, acute type. And the doctor gave no hope for him because it's all spread. Mm. So he didn't know what to do. And then he followed this two months to leave for the yes. program. And uh, about uh, six months to year time, mm. he was completely cured. Praise the Lord. So about eight other uh, patients, cancer patient, came to him, mm -hmm. and he told him same program, huh. and eight of uh, cancer patients all cured. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I never this knew pastor, all this. This pastor uh, visiting each churches and a testimony himself. Well, praise the Lord. How the Lord helped him when they obey with God's Yes. Remedies. Amen. What you you know more about this than I do because I have not been hearing about all these people being healed of mm -hmm. cancer. But you're just telling me for the first time. I've ne I didn't know this, so f please forgive me for getting so excited. And here's uh, sweet Vanita over here. I'm sure she's excited too, aren't you, sweetheart? <laughs> forgive me for putting the camera on you, but uh, I uh, uh, Doctor Mitchell here is an old friend of mine, 
uh, that I've known since when I was pastoring here in uh, Florida. But, uh, you know, it just makes you praise God because I didn't heal anybody and you didn't heal anybody, but God did. Yes, of course. Isn't that wonderful? God did that. Our dear friend that loves Jesus, and uh, we know you love Jesus, don't you? And Jesus loves you. Uh, would you like to share anything with us? Yes, uh, my husband forgot to say that it had gone to my liver. Oh, to the liver, that's very serious. Uh -huh. And that's, I had five spots on my liver, and uh, the tumor has enlarged. It's pretty big now. Yes. And uh, praise God, it's starting to work already. You mean after a week and a half? It started week, one week. A week after one week, yes. And you've been an Adventist for many years? Yes. Mm -hmm. And due to, I think it's due to a lot of stress yes. that I got this thing. Yes. Stress is very hard on the body, that is true. And you've been a vegetarian for many years, haven't you? For 50 years. 50 years. So it's not from eating meat, it's not from smoking cigarettes. Stress is very deadly on the human body. And, but, God is stronger than the devil, isn't that right? Amen. And the lovely Jesus heals today just like he did when he was here on the earth. She was very pale, very weak, uh, no energy, and the uh, face was like a white she as paper, mm. and no pink color at all. Mm. But now, about a week later, uh, she has also a lot of gas pressing here, pain yes. over, and now she, her face getting pink color. Yes, I can tell. And she's uh, less gas pain. Praise Less Lord. pain. Yes. And uh, she feels better, sleep more better than before. And so I measured the size of the liver uh, cancer, and about a week, we found that about was one inch mm. smaller than the first day of we measure it. Praise the Lord, an inch smaller. One inch is smaller than in, the in first we measure in one week. Praise God. Oh friends, our mighty God is the same today. To receive the little book, Two Months to Live, just send any kind of donation to the address at the end of this program and you'll be receiving it right away. In this program, you've learned some shocking things. And I hope that you will show this very program to many people to help open their eyes as to what's happening. Time now is so short. Though we are amid the horrors of the last days, King Jesus is working to heal and to save and he, with his faithful SDA people, will cause his mighty three angels' messages to swell to a loud cry around this whole world, friend, and the devil can't stop it. Praise God. You can have a part in it. Oh, yes. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can work with the lovely Jesus to save precious souls before they're dead. Listen now, as the prophet of God describes in the Great Controversy, page 612, the last work of our mighty God in this world. Quote, Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to declare the message from heaven. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Now rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. Praise God, friend. Praise God.